While design thinking is a buzzword in the corporate world, there's still some confusion about what it means in the classroom. And so today and tonight, actually, we're going to be exploring that with our panel. Simply put, design thinking teaches students how to solve problems by empathizing with those that are affected by the problem or the design challenge. It's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this evening. Dulug is a friend and leads one of the most impactful organization. I'm so proud to also be a board of trustees in this organization, so uh, for full transparency, we came together and in this community uh, have built some very, very strong ties in a fabric of STEAM in our community. And further ado, introducing our moderator for tonight, Dulug Smith. Thank you, thank you, Ed. So uh, thank you to um, UCSD and Sally Ride Science for continuing to hold these conversations and give the community a chance to come together and sort of check in where we are as a community, where, where STEAM is going in all of its many permutations, and ultimately begin to share some imagined futures and be part of those futures as we, as we leave the room tonight. Uh, John Bendringa is the director of Enterprise Strategy and Innovation at the Port of San Diego. So we've got public agency represented. That's, uh, I wanna point out kind of the backgrounds of each of the folks. John leads the newly created uh, de department to um, make the port the world's leading customer-centric and innovative public agency. That's a great idea. Uh, as Senior Director of Honeywell User Experience in Seattle, he led the product design development of advanced mobile computers, handheld scanners, and industrial printers. He's received his degree for product and transportation design from the Arts Center College of Design, and he holds several cross-industry patents and awards for product development and design, including the Idea Gold, the European Red Dot, and the Design of the Decade Award. That's, that's, a, was lucky. that's worth a nod for sure. <laughs> Um, Sonia Risley is founding principal, as in principal of the school, at Design 39 campus. And Sonia actually retired after 33 years in education, working 24 of those years as a principal. And then in 2014, she came back. And she was named as the principal of an innovative new K-8 Design 39 campus. She's been extensively trained in adaptive school strategies, um, which has enhanced her facilitation and presentation skills. Additionally, she's certified extreme leadership facilitator and was named one of the National School Board Association's uh, Technology Leadership Network 20 to Watch in 2014-15. Uh, Sharon is the Senior Interaction Design Manager at Intuit. So we've got a public agency, we've got a school, and we've got private industry. Sharon is a Senior Interaction Design Manager focused on leading amazing design and mentoring a community of 14 interaction designers working on the TurboTax product at Intuit. She has 18 years of experience managing design teams of all sizes and a variety of companies. And prior to her current role, she was the manager of user experience at Sony Electronics and a design lead at Hewlett Packard. She actively runs the customer experience special interest group here in San Diego. So she is giving back in multiple ways. And finally, Maylin Levine is the principal designer, the principal and designer at Visual Asylum. She has been awarded the prestigious AIGA Fellow Award in 2008, and also Downtown San Diego Partnerships Alonzo Award in 2015. Um, she's originally from Colorado and holds a BFA in Graphic Communication Design from University of Denver, and is a graduate of the joint professional program between the Harvard Business School and AIGA. In 2008, she turned her attention to a new passion, and was a founder and board president of the Urban Discovery Academy, which is a highly successful K-8 charter school here in San Diego. And she's currently leading the launch of the new design thinking focused high school, ID8 High Academy. So we've got a great group of people here who all can't sit still and have to just do more. So we're gonna hear about some of that more and we're gonna hear about kind of what inspired them to do that. 
Um, but the very first thing I want to do is, is give each of them a chance to just share with us how you came to understand design thinking. Because it's a term that many people have heard and many people don't know what it means. So I think instead of going straight to a definition, let's just go to that kind of personal anecdote where, where you had an epiphany around design thinking. And for this first round, we're just going to go right across the row here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be speaking here with my esteemed panelists. So um, it's a great question. I think it started for me at a very early age, uh, probably with Legos. And I started building things with Legos, creating things. And then that snowballed into believe it or not, taking things apart, like my dad's expensive video camera. And, uh, and as I was doing that, I started wondering, well, why did, I was calling them engineers at that time, it's of course designers and engineers, why did they pick to do this this way? Why did they put the button there? Why did they put the texture there? And I just had a natural curiosity. Um, so that was where it started. And then as it expanded through my career, I, I keep, thinking that I, I've been working on this canvas. As, as I get to the edge of the canvas, I discover there's more and more to discover. So, um, and that continues to this day. So uh, even with decades of, of wonderful experience, there's still more to learn. So it started very early and it continues. Thank you guys, it's great to be here, I appreciate it. Uh, so I had to think really hard about this because there was no one moment where I realized the awesomeness of design thinking. It's all been a very gradual thing over the last 20 so years. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a very small town in West Virginia and um, daughter of a chemical engineer. So design was not a thing. It was not something that you did. And so I went to, to college and it was before the World Wide Web. Um, Yes, um, it was before then. And, um, and so the program that I went to, the University of Virginia, um, the, th the options there were fine arts and uh, political science, because at the time I was like, oh, I'm going to go be a lawyer. And then one summer, um, I was doing other things, and I picked up Don Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things. And if there was an aha moment in my life, that was my aha moment, because it um, really spoke to me in terms of the psychology of how we think about things in our everyday life and what is functional and what, what does it mean to be functional and what is the psychology behind it. And so um, from that moment on, I was very inspired to kind of craft my own way forward. Um, and I just, I continued studying the user-centered design process and all of the tools that go along with that and the process that goes with that. And now there's been such an evolution. Now we're talking about design thinking, which is the tools and the process, and now it's the mindset. And for me, it's just been such an incredible journey along that way. Mine is similar in a way to John's story. As a, a young girl, I always knew I wanted to be in education and I was always planning, designing in my mind while I was daydreaming in class. And uh, so then I retired from Poway Unified School District after 24 years and uh, that was a great opportunity for me to play with design because uh, I was asked to be a part of design teams several times with Baker Nowicki Design Studio um, as we designed I don't know how many schools together. And that was really fun for me too. It was a very creative outlet and a design outlet and I hadn't put a word to it yet um, and then when I was asked in 2012 to open a new K-8 school in Poway uh, I, I um, was doing a lot of research trying to think of all these great things we could do for kids and I also at that time found an online course of design thinking and how to use design thinking and that was a huge aha moment and I was hooked from then on and so uh, we also I knew that I wanted to look at what parents wanted and what students wanted in a new school that was going to be optional enrollment, not just a neighborhood school. And so I was able to then apply the uh, design thinking strategies to gain, to empathize, uh, define, and all, all the different parts of it. So it was a really helpful time for me to find design thinking as I built Design 39 Campus. 
I think, um, so for me, um, I think the moment where I understood the phraseology of design thinking was after Baker and Nowicki introduced me to Sonia. Um, but before that, I realized that I was practicing design thinking for the past 35 years as a designer. And um, folks in the room here that I know from that are affiliated with AIGA, um, we have commiserated over the years about how the way we think is valuable to companies. And it's really um, more than the artifact that we're creating for a company and a brand identity or an interior design or what have you, that it's really the way we think. And Ron Muriello has quoted this in, in every public meeting I've been in with him. Um, you know, the, the, the way we think as designers, um, we're naturally um, using this process of design thinking, which is really about, you know, researching and empathizing who the end user is, um, trying uh, things out and failing and trying over and over again, which is, um, it's a good thing that I knew that, that system in trying to create a school from nothing um, because there's a lot of trial and error and failure and, and getting uh, back up on your, uh, with, by your bootstraps or whatever metaphor you choose. Um, so for me, the aha moment was that there's finally a name for this thing that I have been doing and my uh, compadres have been doing for, for years and years. And to see the transformation, the power in the way design and design thinking, um, you know, has an effect on every part of our everyday life. So. Great, thank you all. So let's let's shift a little bit now into that notion of of this this thing has a name, right? And it has a methodology, and it's really now even being recognized as a way of thinking, way of behaving. So Sharon, if you would give us a sense of how you guys at Intuit um, have defined design thinking. And then we're going to hear a little bit from John about how the port has de has defined it so that we can do a little kind of compare and contrast. Great. Yeah. So for us at Intuit, um, we think about it in terms of starting with empathy for the customer. That's the most important part in building up the relationship, understanding the mindset. And then from that, we do an ideation phase where we go very broad and we come up with as many concepts as we can based on the customer problems that we identified by truly understanding the customer's mindset and their emotional feelings, their function, you know, their functional needs, all of that combined. Then once we have a bunch of very different concepts and we go very broad, then we take that back and we test it with customers and we narrow down into something that we think will be viable based on technical constraints, business needs, but most importantly, are we solving the right problem for the customer with the right solution? And then we'll go back, we'll go broad again with additional concepts to confirm that we're going in the right direction and we're coming up with the right solution. Um, and then eventually we'll narrow to the final execution phase and deliver that for implementation as a software product. So we call it the double diamond in terms of design thinking, but it's going going broad and then narrowing and going broad again. So um, when you say double diamond, so you're saying you start narrow. Start with the research and the customer empathy, mm -hmm. and most that's, important that's part. That's the center diamond. Or the yeah, that's the beginning of the entire process. Mm -hmm. And then we go very broad in terms of our concepts mm -hmm. and the things we're gonna test, and then we narrow down based on going back to the customer. Great. John, how about at the port? And you've, you've brought this to the port, I think. Yeah, uh, and myself and uh, a few others, um, and uh, they're a willing participant, I have to say. Um, we, we are a public service agency, and uh, that starts with the word public, which is people, and uh, so it's really important to understand, A, who they are and uh, um, where their pain points or friction points are or where their pleasure points are, and be able to generate concepts to either retain those those favorable conditions or really resolve the unfavorable ones. Uh, we also use a very, very similar process. We start with uh, observation. Um, now, the customers at the port are, you know, there's quite a range, as you might imagine. So we've got the citizens of the five member cities. 
Um, so the Port of San Diego, the Bay, uh, has five cities that touch it. Of course, San Diego, Chula Vista, National City, Imperial Beach, and Coronado. Um, so if you add all those citizens up, it's about 1.6 million. And there's a huge diversity in that population. Then we've got tourists, 34, 35 million tourists a year. Of course, we've got all sorts of businesses. Uh, so there's a B2B component. And we've got the employees of the port itself. So we create uh, personas, kind of these fictional representations of the various customers that we serve. Um, and we understand what they value. Um, and then again, try to understand through their customer journey where there's an opportunity to reduce friction or pain and or build or enhance uh, the pleasure. Um, the double diamond we use as well. We start very, very uh, focused on the customer and then we do a divergent thinking where we remove the constraints uh, and there's serious constraints, right? We've got to ensure that we protect the environment. We have to ensure that the agency is um, financially viable long term. Um, but initially, sometimes those can slow down thinking. So we remove those and we allow the team to go very broad and then we reapply the other end of the diamond where we converge. And then that's typically once we have those ideas where we start prototyping uh, in a very low fidelity, low cost type of way. So it parallels very much the process you're using, except the, you know, the, the customers are so far ranging from uh, residents to tourists to B2B. So um, you're having to think about a diverse set of personas. Just to clarify, Sharon, when you guys are thinking about your customers, are you equally thinking about a broad set of personas for your products? We are thinking about a broad set of personas. So um, TurboTax has 30 million customers um, from all economic walks of life, all different backgrounds, very diverse customer set. And we offer different products based on the complexity of their tax situation. And so we um, really work hard to understand people based on their, their tax complexity, their financial lives, and basically their emotional needs. And so we do empathy trips where we, for example, working on a product um, for the self-employed uh, customer, we did a whole empathy trip to Denver and we took all of our, um, our programmers on the team, software engineers, I should say, um, we took our product managers, some people from research, myself as a designer, and we went out and we talked to 20 customers of all different ranges in the Denver uh, metropolitan area, some um, who were just starting out as a business, some who've been in business for a long period of time, some who didn't even think of themselves as a business. It, it, fascinating to just enter these people's lives and really try to understand them from a very emotional perspective. Just amazing to do it. Well, and I th the reason I wanted to clarify that is because even though you both have talked about this double diamond and going to the very narrow um, focus on the customer and then broad, in fact, even within that, that customer analysis, there's a lot of diversity. There, there are many factors to keep in mind. It's not as though it's a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, that the customers really have the same complexity as the regular population, which is clear for the port. So let's let's shift now a little bit to how this how this approach um, gets applied and utilized in three different settings. So we're going to talk about the school setting. We'll talk about the industry setting, and then we'll talk about the the public agency setting. So we'll start with the schools, and um, both Maylin and Sonia are going to speak to this, or based on their their unique experiences of design thinking in the classroom like what and how is design thinking being utilized as a learning tool and for the preparation the student preparation for their adult lives well with um design 39 being a actually preschool through eighth grade campus we um, decided to start early with our parents and then we bring it to the kids and we found that using empathy with the kids helps them in a lot of other aspects besides just solving challenges in our campus so it's just how to relate to everybody else somebody else's point of view and so then we really go through all the steps of it with them we look at um, defining it from the point of view of someone else and then ideating lots Lots of and lots of ideas. We're great at ideating uh, the old notion of yes and. 
what's another idea? Yes, and what's another? And get hundreds. Of, we uh, have sticky notes. Uh, we should buy stock in sticky notes at, at Design 39. <laughs> and then uh, their favorite part is then to prototype and going into our makeries and start to make things with their hands and show a sample or, or a design idea. If it's a concept idea, then they show that idea and start to pitch it. And uh, then they bring it out to test it with their users and see if it's working and then uh, if they need to make changes, they go back to the beginning again. And our whole notion at Design 39 is that we will never be done. If our school is ever done or a project is ever done, it's dead. Then we're like any other public school. And so uh, some of the examples that we had was like playground time. Kindergarten and first graders wanted to redesign what playground time looks like. So they spent the design thinking process going through that and talking to all sorts of kids, even the bigger kids, which was a little intimidating. But then they started planning what the playground would look like and, and what you could use the play equipment, the traditional equipment, how you could use it differently and have different, more engaging um, ideas. Then we also had our, our second, third graders just finished up a big, almost a 10 month long uh, Maker 39. Everything has to be 39. We're the 39th school in the district. Um, so, <laughs> so all the two, three kids, every student in our second, third grade had to come up with a business and think about how to find out from users what product they wanted. So for about 10 months, they kept going through the whole design cycle and making their businesses, prototyping them, trying them out. And then other students from around the school would come to the Maker's Fair and vote with tickets on which business they liked until it came down to 39 top businesses that were going to actually be put in uh, into business and invested in and parents of course invested and so those kiddos then were able to hire some of the other businesses that fell apart so they learned how to go through the interview process um, our kids have designed golf courses and made little miniature prototypes of that um, our four five six worked with into it with their design for delight um, facilitators they came in to rethink how to do physical education, which we now call Minds in Motion or MEM. So we could really rethink and make that activity fun and engaging for kids. Um, and then even things like uh, curriculum content that yes, we do have to teach them the content. So the things like learning about social classes through the book of the Titanic and looking at the various classes that were on that ship and each child then becoming that class, the steerage or the first class or that kind of thing and empathizing what was it like to be with that and then designing their, their clothing and all that kind of thing or cell structure. What is it like to be a cell and how do we design that and they would convert classrooms into cells and uh, modern day missions. Think about when you're learning about missions instead of building a mission, build a modern day mission with different alternative energies and that kind of thing. So those are some of the examples of how we've used design thinking to use our curriculum and to solve challenges in our community and our, on our campus. Yeah, so we're, um, uh, Urban Discovery Academy is uh, not a design thinking focused school, but rather a project-based learning school. And the high school program that we've just started this year, we started with ninth graders, um, is a focused program on design thinking. And so the things, fortunately or unfortunately, this year we had to incubate the high school program, the ninth graders, in the same building with the K-8 students, which turns out was an amazing opportunity for the, a real collaboration um, not only between the students, but also between the staff members um, and the cross-pollination between the K-8 students and the high school students is really amazing to watch. Um, so I know of one project in particular um, that the high school students worked on, which was to design a new electronic game board um, for a, their, their target audience was fourth grade. And so they met with and empathized with the fourth graders. They got all kinds of input from the fourth graders on what kind of games they like, you know, um, 
so they gathered their the input, they empathized with the their clientele, um, and then throughout the process, they would go back to the fourth graders and make their presentation and get feedback and criticism on what was working, what wasn't working, um, until they finally uh, resolved the problem and solved the, the gaming uh, challenge um, for their target audience. So it wasn't just a personal expression for them, they were solving a problem for an audience. Yeah, great. So I think that's a, a good segue then to Sharon to talk a little bit about what does this process look like at Intuit, right? So now we've, we're going from an educational setting into a business setting uh, where you've, you've got profit uh, that you have to be attentive to. You've got a large set of employees that you have to be attentive to, and, and you're trying to rally them all to use this approach. How do you do that? Well, for us at Intuit, it's, it's really embedded in our culture in terms of the way we work, how we work. Um, it's part of our value system. It's part of um, when someone starts at Intuit, it's part of their training. Um, and so it, it's just, I, it's hard to explain this, but it's, it's, you don't even think about it. It's just something that you do. Um, and so we always um, start off, you know, every new project everyone not just the designers but everyone is talking about what the customer problem is that we're going to try and solve um, and that's based on business need um, sometimes but really on what essentially is driving the customer and then of course we reach out we do the empathy piece we talk to our customers we interview them we bring them on site we do a lot in terms of of that anybody can set up an interview with a customer that there's just tools available for anyone to do that at any time. Um, and then, of course, we have tools at hand um, as, a, as a private business. We have tools at hand where we can rapidly prototype out things and put them in front of customers very quickly and ideate together and um, cross-collaborate. So it's, it's, yeah, I always have to struggle with it because it's just such, it's so embedded in what we do and, and why we deliver the, what, what we deliver. And so design principles, everyone knows the end-to-end -end design principles that are driving our product. So, you, but you've also mentioned to me um, that this approach is used in departments that are not product-focused departments. It is, yeah. And so that's why I mentioned um, that it's part of our values. So we have eight core values at Intuit um, around being bold, um, win together, deliver awesome, because it's about teamwork and cross collaboration, and it's about being bold with your ideas, and it's about having integrity with what you do, and um, being passionate, and um, you know, delivering awesome together. So these are amazing values, and we actually use these values as part of our hiring process. So we used um, design thinking in terms of revamping our entire hiring process, so that we start with the values that we're hiring for, um, and we identify them as a collaborative team. What are those values that we're looking for for this specific role? And then we map for candidates, we map back to those values. Are they exhibiting the values that we are trying to hire, hire for? And it's based on those eight. Um, and so that way we get people who already have this design thinking mindset from the outset. They're already bold, they're already passionate, they're already customer inspired, they already um, work with integrity, they already know how to deliver awesome, they know how to win together. So we, we combine all of that together into our, our hiring process. And I, I expect candidates don't really know that, but we do. And, um, and then when we hire the candidates, we have our, our a new hire program where we expose them to Design for Delight, which is our internal branding for basically design thinking. And that's where we're going to show them all the tools and methodologies that we have around design thinking so that everyone, whether they're in HR or finance or software engineering, has these tools at hand and knows how to use them. Great. And then John. So just listening to the other panelists, it's it's fascinating to hear so many of the consistencies in words so you've talked about delight for example for years i've used this phrase delight features and it can be a small thing or a large thing um, so we're using a couple of different techniques um, the first is simply by doing so one of the biggest things that we've done is involve uh, cross-functional organizations so it's not just the designer's job to understand the problem and come up with the concepts 
it's everybody's. We all have a role in understanding who the user is and how we might make their lives better. Um, and what's interesting is that has this positive byproduct of building a very, very strong and collaborative culture, uh, which is powerful. Um, another technique we do is um, in the, so we call it uh, people-centered design. A lot of times you'll hear it called human-centered design, but at the port we're calling it people-centered design for a variety of reasons. That's largely because we're here to benefit the people. Um, but throughout those five stages, observe and understand, concept, prototype, and share, um, there's different tools within the toolbox that we use. And uh, one of the ones we did just recently was a design jam where we had a problem to solve. Uh, we brought cross-functional uh, people in. And for two and a half days, we did nothing but that divergent thinking of concept development. And then towards the end, um, you know, converging right back into the, the piece. And not only did we get a benefit in terms of concepts, but we got a probably even stronger benefit in terms of camaraderie and teamwork. Um, we also look outside. We look at, well, what do companies and agencies that use design thinking, how do they, what are they benefiting from, you know, whether it be financial or what have you. There's a very well-known uh, DMI study called the Design Index, which was done um, in 2014, where it took a number of companies uh, that have embraced design, design thinking, and compared them to S&P, just the normal S&P companies. And over a 10-year period, if you had invested $10,000 in one of the S&P companies, um, you would have probably made around $19,000 10 years later, so a benefit of $9,000. If you had invested in the design-centric companies, it went to $39,000, I believe. So your investment went much, much further. So we're using that as a, a little bit of a proof point um, that that works. And then we're also looking at very innovative uh, leading government agencies in the United States and throughout the world that have really embraced this. Gainesville, Florida, for example, is one that worked with IDO. So we're using a, you know, teaching or learning by doing internally. We're looking at reference information on the outside, whether it be financial or otherwise. And then we're looking at um, leading government agencies that have already kind of taken the, uh, uh, had the courage to, to take the approach of people-centered design. So um, we're gonna sh we're gonna take that notion of you know looking out in the world and having to find other examples because basically the flip side of that statement is there are not broad sets of examples there are limited sets of examples at, at this moment and so that really then begs the question well what does it take to make the case for more design thinking. In, in all sorts of settings, right? The settings we've been describing, but there are others uh, to consider as well. So, Maylin, we're gonna start with you thinking about um, parents and kind of making the case with the parents of these young people so that they understand what you're trying to do with their young people um, because they've sent them to school and they probably didn't go to a school that was functioning this way. Yeah, well, and thanks to Sally Ride Science and Ed and UCSD, we can now point parents to this video, which will be very helpful. Um, just uh, in terms of parents seeing that there's, you know, folks in the world embracing the strategies and the thinking, and that there's a future for that student in both their educational um, career after high school, but then also where does that lead to a job, right? And if there are more and more companies um, embracing design thinking and really understanding that what we need to do is, is develop students who are creative thinkers. I mean, bottom line, that's what we need um, going forward. Uh, we need students who are agile and can think on their feet and, and shift gears and, um, you know, not just more folks um, who are expert note takers sitting in large classrooms listening to lectures. Um, you know, that, that era hopefully is, is going, uh, going away. Um, and so I know that in my research, in, in thinking about a high school program, um, and selfishly for my daughter, who's in the ninth grade program too, um, you know, just really looking for something at the high school level. Well, locally, there really wasn't anything other than High Tech High. And High Tech High is a great um, benchmark, but 
but they were established and started 15 years ago. And so things have evolved now beyond high tech, high methodologies. Um, and we really wanted to do something different, even more different than high tech high. Um, and it's really hard for parents to get students into high tech high. It's the most highly sought after program um, in, in the charter school uh, world. And um, so I think for parents, it's been a struggle for them to understand what design thinking is and how well will their student do in college. And so fortunately, Etta Beta is on our, our board and can answer that question for them. Um, at, at our school, we are offering um, coursework that is uh, a college coursework, so they're getting credit, not just AP classes, which if Ed got on his bandwagon about AP classes, we'd all you know not be so interested in them anymore. Um, so you know we're trying to do something different, and there's not really a model out there per se exactly of what we're you're trying to do. You're having to make the case and use all available resources, and now there's going to be a new resource for you to use, which is great. And yeah, and I think the tests test scores and just um, seeing that students, so it's, it's sort of like the analogy um, that John had about um, S&P investment versus uh, a company who invests in design. You know, this project-based learning and the way, the approach of the program is proving positive. So students were testing, my daughter was one of them, um, she came up 14 uh, points, percentile points, in a, in, in a one-year gap. And so, you know, I think once there's m more data like that, that parents, you know, the only thing they know about to ask about how good a school is or not are the test scores. And what we're trying to do is so much, you know, bigger, broader, different than just the test scores. Sonia, you have had to be attentive to the teacher preparation side of this and working directly with universities because ultimately you can't teach design thinking if you don't have teachers that know how to do that. So can you give us a little sense of, of how you're seeing uh, this dynamic work in terms of teacher preparation and the relationships to the university programs? Okay. As we were interviewing, uh, our first year most of our teachers were transfers from within Poway Unified School District, but we had a few new people, new to t teaching, just graduated from universities, and we could see that their mindset wasn't quite where we needed it to be. So like into it, we they go through a pretty rigorous design thinking interview process, but then they uh, also then, once they're hired, go through a design training uh, in the summer, a design boot camp. And what we found then is that as we went further along and needed new teachers out of the universities, that I started reaching out to our local universities and asking to take cohorts of student teachers. I wanted to have them in the school because trying to talk to universities uh, is a different method than going in through their students. So I, we would bring in um, eight or nine student teachers every time. Cal State San Marcos is one of the biggest ones because they're close to where we are. So uh, it was always interesting and fun because we had to help them understand design thinking because they'd come in and watch this and go, this is not what I've learned for four years. And then their supervisor would come in and after they'd be out looking at the student teachers, they'd come back to me and say, we've got to talk. <laughs> Okay, so then I would help them understand what design thinking is and how they need to look at classroom management in a different way. They need to look at how we're bringing curriculum to kids in a different way. So it was just, a, in my mind, a different way to then start bringing that back to the universities. So then it started getting more attention and I was able to have um, conversations with more universities and we'd get one or two candidates from different places around the county and that was uh that's the way that we're showing them how how this can work yeah so you're having to to make make the practical case even as you're doing the work correct yeah john um you've mentioned you've got five city members to the port you've got you did not mention but but you mentioned to us on the phone you also have regulators so you you guys are accountable to the state and federal regulations environmental regulations uh you've got your tenants you've got the public and of course all of these different stakeholders are bringing a particularly different point of view they need to be uh, engaged in different emotional ways so how does your staff engage these range of stakeholders to kind of understand and value what you're trying to achieve through design thinking? 
One of the things we are investigating right now is um, from a prosperity point of view, from a longevity in terms of the financial longevity and successfulness of the Port of San Diego, we really have to ensure that whatever decisions we make are going to um, you know, ensure we're there for a long time, right? We could very easily make a decision to go invest a lot of money in something and put the put the port in an undesirable spot and we just can't do that that's not what our charter is um, so there's a prosperity element and depending on um, who you talk to they may be more or less focused on the prosperity piece there's a planet profit you talked about some of the regulators mm -hmm. um, the california coastal commission is a big one right it's critical that we you know respect and maintain the environment. I mean, it's a beautiful bay and it can only get better. So depending again on who you're talking to, they may have more of a focus on the environmental side. So we've got prosperity, we've got planet, and then we've got the people. So all of these need to be in balance, in harmony. And we may look at parts of the bay that perhaps we focus more on the people. I mean, Embarcadero might be an example of that. Or we might focus on other parts of the bay that's much, much more focused on environmental, maybe some of the wetlands areas. So that's one of the things that from almost a conceptual level we're starting to look at is we can't just look at one particular aspect. We have to keep very uh, thorough understanding of how we balance the benefit to the people, the respect for the environment, and ultimately the long-term viability of the port itself. So similar to what Mei Lin was saying, basically you're using your outcomes as your method of convincing that if you are showing positive environmental outcomes or you're showing positive people-centric outcomes, that your own evidence is, your, is, is the driving the allowance for the behavior. We, uh, we have a phrase called an EXO or coined a term EXO. It's, it's short for experience outcomes. So when we architect an EXO or a sentence, we have to identify who the user is, what job they're doing, and what type of success criteria uh, we're expecting. So in every type of XO that we're solving for, the problems that we're solving for, we understand who the user is, what type of job. A job could be finding a parking spot. A job could be uh, having an all-day adventure. And then success criteria. It could be time-based, frequency, volume. So yes, we're already baking in the criteria on how we're going to measure and perhaps how high we're going to set the bar in terms of where our um, you know, expectation is of success that's already starting in those problem statements. So they so, trace all the way through. Uh, I set you up. We actually had a question here that said, how do you bake in accountability into design thinking process? So we've already answered that one. As you can hear, you, you literally set the expectations uh, as part of the process itself, right? It has to be measurable, absolutely. And it's not always measurable by money. It can be time, it could be volume or frequency. So we're going to, um, Sharon, because you had talked a little bit of already about kind of how the culture is both managed and created, I want to just j jump to questions, if you don't mind, um, how your culture at Intuit is managed, particularly that recruitment piece, and, and that's all very insightful. Um, so uh, the, quest the second question I want to bring us to is um, a question related to education. Um, so this is a question from someone who actually is providing um, design thinking tools to schools, but but potentially seeing some resistance. So what what would you say, either Sonia or Melin, what would you say to schools who feel that they already have too many things on their plate? They can't add design thinking to the uh, list of activities and curriculum that they're already presenting to their kids. Any any thought on how you might help them understand? So in my retired life now, I uh, consult with different organizations. And one of the things that I talk to people about is, what are you holding on to so tight? How effective is it? And if you were going to use design thinking to engage kids and have 100% engagement, 
what can you let go? Yes, we have too many things on our plates as educators. What are you going to let go? And how are you going to do that? And then really work on that. And I coach them through that process of really starting to let go of some things to then go and, and pick up a design thinking mindset. It's a whole different game, a whole different level of excitement for the students and then therefore the educators. And the, the depth of learning is fabulous. Great. Um, here's another question about uh, how, to, how we kind of transfer design thinking to new, new spaces. Um, so I'm, I'll just read it directly. Has design thinking transferred to all career paths and businesses? Um, would you say that there are examples across all sectors or are they sort of still just developing in some and, and more mature in others? I'd say they're developed in some very developed in some and maturing in others and nascent in others. Um, someone mentioned the word creativity. That's been around a long time. And at the heart of everything we're talking about today is creativity and really creating a environment where creativity is applauded and embraced rather than kind of rejected. So I think creativity has been around. Now we're finding a methodology for kind of organizing that creativity into a meaningful way. If I can jump on that too, and, uh, for staff development at Design 39, rather than doing the same old thing and me talking to them, I always set up field trips on non-student days for them to go out to various businesses to see how they were using design thinking and, and what the work world is all about. And I would say that out of um, when I would call to try to get some dates for my teachers to be able to be there, I was surprised at how much design thinking is out there. Um, and being up in North County uh, in the Forest Ranch area, and a lot of technology businesses up there are using it a lot more frequently, and I was pleasantly surprised. Sharon, um, in our preparation for tonight's discussion, you mentioned that uh, Intuit, being a large, um, well-known, well-respected company, also views its role as helping to disseminate design thinking to smaller firms, startups, and even to other sectors potentially. Can you kind of talk about how that works for you guys? Yeah, so um, Intuit is a role model for other companies. We're one of those companies uh, in terms of design thinking who's done very well in the stock market over the last few years um, based on how we, we changed our culture so that we are focused on design. We're design-led, our CEO, Brad Smith, declared we're design led and now it's uh, it's in our very very um, integrated very well into our culture um, and so we have people who are uh, very much inspired by design thinking again we call it design for delight and so uh, they go out into the community as innovation catalysts and work with groups throughout the San Diego community I myself um, partner with the design lab with the design students there in order to educate them on early careers as designers and what that might look like for them and the tools and mindsets that they need to be successful. So it's, it's part of our values. Um, part of Intuit's values is we care and give back. And so I think because we're all passionate around solving complex pro problems by understanding people, we want to give back to our community that way. Um, um, the last question here, um is really related to the end point for this work. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit focused on uh, children, although John, your role in a public agency also speaks to this, but the question reads, tell us how design thinking can lead our children to innovate beyond products and better address our social issues. Um, homelessness is the example given here, but I think that you could substitute any number of, of social issues. Um, traffic, congestion, climate change, um, whatever, whatever. So would any of you like to speak a little bit about how, how this process gets applied to, to purposeful pursuits beyond product pursuits? I know, I know that the um, UDA, the Urban Discovery Academy students, um, the fourth graders, um, because we're located um, in this neighborhood, in East Village at 14th and F, um, you know, the students and parents are um, faced with really, you know, seeing homelessness up close and personal every day, trying to get to and from school. And um, when we moved into our new location, it really struck a chord with the students. And so 
as part of the, their uh, self-guided um, creation of projects, I think it was fourth grade, and, and forgive me, I'm not an educator in the classroom, so I'm a board president and hear about the, the good works. But anyway, I think it was fourth grade. Um, really wanted to do something um, and study the issue. And um, they took an entire semester um, to really empathize with what's happening in downtown um, with, around the homelessness issue. And um, I don't know where it ended up, but I, I know that, this, that the school and the principal um, and the teacher embraced the need for the students to do something. And, and to understand the issue as opposed to simply walk by it. So we've only got a couple of minutes left and I wanna give you all a chance to look into the future, pull out your own personal crystal ball and tell us where you think um, or what you think the future looks like with design thinking being embedded at the heart of school life, work life, civic life, just you know, an example, an idea, uh, a wish, any anything that, that is futuristic. So I'll, I'll start because I just talked to a bunch of U, UCSD design students about this. And I was asked that specific question, where did I think design thinking was going? And, um, and my answer was, I think it's being interwoven into our everyday life. It is a mindset around solving tough problems complex problems. And so this was a discussion with business students and design students. And I said, what we're gonna start seeing is more government agencies taking this design thinking mindset and moving forward with it to solve the really large social problems, large environmental problems, large economic problems. We're gonna to need to have um, an army of people who are educated in design thinking to go out and solve these overwhelming problems that we have in society around the world. Um, and it, I saw the light bulb go on for some of these students and I was approached by them afterward like, oh, wow, like it's beyond designing a product and it should be beyond designing a product. A product is just a product. It's around really getting to the heart of things and solving huge problems with empathy. And so the more we can inspire students, the more we can educate people in all walks of life around design thinking, the better we will be as a society. Could I just take a stab at that? So at the end of the day, an education is an experience. And what we're seeing today is that by understanding who the customers are, we rapidly understand that everybody has different values everyone expects different experiences and the really leading companies are um, creating experience that really map to you personally to me personally and they may not be the same i think education is going to move there where instead of having to fit into a specific curriculum the way it's always been done for those that fit in it it's wonderful for those that don't it's not wonderful so can we by using human-centered design, design thinking, really create an adaptable environment for learning based on what each and every student is gonna benefit from. So before we give our, our last two panelists a chance to comment, I just wanna say that John has just repeated one of the statements that was made at our last Sally Ride Science uh, convenings, which, which was essentially, in 10 years we may not have sixth grade because of what you're just describing. We may be able to provide an education that's so personalized that the notion of a grade has begun to evaporate. And I think that um, you guys could probably even comment on that further because that is essentially what you're offering your students. Right, right. So in, for me also with uh, design thinking, it's becoming much more interesting to all educators. There are a lot more design events like this and a lot more people are coming out for those. And so it's very exciting. And if you think about Sir Ken Robinson and talking about how schools kill creativity, design thinking, blasts it right through the, the, and it's into the sky. So you get creative confidence, you get kids who are innovators, you get kids that collaborate really well because you can't do this in a vacuum, and you get kids who are really going to be ready, like uh, Sharon's saying, that they'll be ready for, for their company, they'll wanna hire Design 39 students at Intuit. 
But um, for that is one of our goals at Design 39 too, is to really open up the walls for their learning as well, so that pretty soon there are no grade levels. And that's why I was already talking about a K-1 group, a 2-3 group. We try to blend those already. We're trying, we call it blurring the lines. We're trying to eventually just soften the whole thing. And students have the ability to move from place to place because we're design thinkers. We're trying to think of those users. What do they need? They don't need to sit in a math class that they've already learned or that they are too far behind. They might need to go to a different group and we try to make it as seamless as possible. So we use design thinking as we create the experiences for the students. So I'm very hopeful and I'll keep working that way to help education change in that form. So I'm very inspired by the question. Um, to think about the future um, without constraints. I wish that we had a society right now full of creative design thinkers to help solve our, um, the state of our country and the political climate. That's my wish for the future. There you have it. That's a call to action if I ever heard one get to work on getting the world populated with design thinkers. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for our panelists, their wisdom, their experience, their ideas, their observations, uh, everything that they've shared with us today. And thank you to Sally Ride Science, STEAM, Series, and UC San Diego for hosting us. Thank you all. Thank you.